All right, guys. So we're going to start chapter 15, keeping time, scheduling tasks, and launching programs. So essentially, we have a gigantic problem when we write a program, and it's how we manage dates and times. And it's not a gigantic problem if you do it the supported method. The problem is when you're learning to program, everyone at least tries once, and they venture off, and they do their own thing, and they don't realize there's a supported method. So you kind of have to know that don't ever do anything yourself with time because it's very complex. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when we talk about time, we often use assumptions that aren't true. If I ask you how many days in a year there are, you may jump back at me and say there's 365. But of course, that doesn't include leap years. So what does that say if you try to go back or forward 20 years? You're off, right? Your dates are suddenly, your date math is screwed up. Uh, depending on the scope in which you're using math, you may find other assumptions, even ones you don't care about that are off, right? You may calculate seconds in the past week or something of that sort and come out with a different number than your computer comes out with. Why? Because even though you don't care about leap seconds, your computer does care about leap seconds. There's a really interesting video on this where Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about why he likes iPhones more than Androids. And he just gives the reviewer like a screw you answer, like I don't care about that. And his, he goes into explaining it and it's because the iPhone actually takes into account leap seconds. Uh, and this is like a very super complex and geeky topic, but the point is, is that at all different levels, and like the big scale with leap years and at the small scale with leap seconds, and then there's this, you know, if you have leap seconds, do you need leap years? And then you infuse date time zones, so you say, okay, you're moving from Houston to California, how are you gonna figure out time zone offsets and switch them back? There are, that's a solved problem in many senses. So today we're going to learn about how we can use other people's solution to those problems. I'm gonna advise you never to write your own. There's uh, a little bit more we cover in this chapter. Some of it's gonna be about how we do multitasking, run two things at the same time. And uh, we'll be covering that with this very, very brief introduction on what Python calls threads. Uh, and we could talk a little bit about that too. So kicking it off, there's a, a module called time, all right? And it's providing you two features that they're talking about here, time.time and time.sleep. We can go ahead and take a look at some of those, right? Breaking away from the textbook to some degree because it's always a good idea to show and supplement that with other information. We're gonna use the Python utilities. And you can see I've opened up a Python instance on the right-hand side. I'm gonna go import uh, time, right? And then I'm gonna go help time and it's gonna tell me everything about this. I'll make it bigger so we can take a look at it. And you can see here that the module is described as uh, handling standard representations of time, right? Module provides various functions to manipulate time values. So you can see how it breaks it down. Year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds, weekday. Here's another thing too. There are conversion factors computers can do and then there's ones that they can't do, <coughs> right? So a week is defined as having seven days. Every week has seven days. There's no exception to that, right? Every month doesn't have 30 days. So months have different amounts of days. So you can convert now, by proxy of that, days to weeks, but you can't convert them days to months. So there's different conversions that these types of modules will allow you to do. And if you ever get in a situation where you say, well, why the hell can't I convert days to months, but I can convert days to weeks, if you think about it for a second, it'll make a lot more sense than it does because when you program it, it's gonna give you a very bizarre error if you try to do that, right? In the abstract, it gives you a bizarre error. And what I mean by that is, if you attach it to a specific time zone and you give it a specific date, then it can in fact convert that to months. You can say well, how many months were in this interval here. And the computer can figure that out. So uh, we look at this module and we see get the breakdown of it, right? We got some things we can do. Here's some functions. Now, we already know that we're gonna be using time. What does time do? It returns the current time in seconds since the epoch is afloat. What is an epoch? Well, everyone has to have a time zero, right? Computers call the time zero an epoch and there's two different big ones. There's one on the Unix machines and then there's one on the Windows machines. And essentially, we have two different values. One of them is in the 70s and that's when Unix first woke up and one of them is in the 90s and people would argue Windows was always asleep and then never changed. But nonetheless, we have two different epochs for that. Uh, you've all heard about year 2000. That's like this confusing factor where you have uh, rollover when you write things out in decimal notation. Well, there's another one where you actually roll things over in binary, right? And what does that mean? 
That means that if we add on one second every second since 1970, you have a certain value, right? And that's going to be time dot time. Eventually, that number becomes so big, it can't fit in one 32-bit integer, and the computer rolls it over. And then you have problems. Let me show you a little bit about that. We take it here. We're going to go import time, time dot time. And you can see here what that number is. See how big it is? 155, whatever, quadrillion, million, you know, some, some gigantic, big-ass number. Well, eventually, that number becomes so big that it rolls over, too, right? No matter how you store it. And based on that, you can see problems that computers may have. So one of those rollovers is going to happen in 2032. And that's when, essentially, all 32-bit machines that are using time in this format croak because they can no longer store it like that. Right, second since 1970. There's just too many of them. So this idea of epoch, it's everywhere. And all you need to remember is that there's a certain point in time when computers came live. We call that the epoch. And when something is referring to that inside of a programming language, they essentially mean seconds from that date. Right? And here's how we figure that out, time dot time. Looking at some of the other functions we have, we have time dot clock. What does it do? It returns the CPU time since the process start is afloat. That's a fancy way of saying how long your, your thing has been running, right? We have sleep, delay for a number of seconds, given it as a float. That's also very common. We're going to see that I'll use a lot today. We have GM time, convert seconds since epoch to UTC tuple, right? Anyone know what UTC stands for? Universal coordinated time. Say it one more time. Universal coordinated time. Universal coordinated time. Close enough. I think it's in the opposite order because it's I French. Think, this, this, well, it's not French or English because they conflicted. So there was already a UC system or UT system. And they had a C for coordinated afterwards. So it doesn't match up to either language. Interesting. Yeah. OK, well, that's good. good. At least the French didn't get their way. I'm happy with that as an American. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's this thing. And actually, what's interesting about this is we have GMT here, right, too. What does GMT stand for? Does anyone know? That's right, Greenwich, right? So Greenwich is this area where essentially people left for the first time and decided they were going to cross the Atlantic with clocks. And they were using clocks for navigation. And that became a big thing. So if you move to the left of it, you offset it in time zone that direction. And if you move to the right with it, you offset it in the other direction. So one of them is positive, and one of them is negative, And that's how we get time zones. So this was originally GM time, and then it became UTC time. And there's very little difference between the two. That's why they're referred to here as the same name. And you may see them in either which way. And if you care about the difference, Wikipedia. Uh, local time, right? Convert the second since epoch to local time tuple, right? Slightly different than the uh, seconds is afloat, because I think here we're, we're getting it in a different fashion. So let's take it and let's take a look at that. Time dot local time, and that's how we get it here. So when we did time dot time, we got this as a float, which is one big long number. When we do time dot local time, what do we get it as? We get it as a struct, right? So then from that point on, I can say tm mun, and that actually tells me the month. So this is a method where it's actually parsed out. We can easily get the year, the month, the day, all that kind of stuff when we call time dot local time. We we'll go back to help, and we'll see what else we have. ASC time, convert the time in tuple to a string. What does that look like? We can say time dot time, and then we can say no time dot ASC time, time dot local time, and what do we get? We get our actual date, Wednesday, May eighth. It's eighteen eighteen. It's computer or twenty four hour clock six eighteen. Okay. So we've seen all this stuff, and we can just go down. Let's finish it off here. Convert time to string, seconds to string. Convert time in seconds to string. So we have up here returns the current time in seconds since epoch. This does the same thing, but this is accepting the C time, right? MK time, convert local time tuple to seconds since epoch. So this one takes the other format and makes it seconds. You can see at this point that there's a conversion, and that's kind of what I wanted to get through to you. So I don't need to exhaust all of it. We have a concept of a time object, which stores all of the parsed crap out for us. 
And then we have a concept of second since epoch, which stores that as one number, right? And there's methods to go back and forth. Change the local time zone. That's the other one. And then we have these two, which are both formatting. Convert time tuple to string according to format specification. Parse string to time tuple according to format specification. I think we cover both of those in this chapter, but that's essentially this. We have this time object, and it stores all of this different stuff for us, right? How do we get it in a specific format? If, we're, if someone gives us a format and they say, I want my time to look like this. And there is a method in which we can do that too. All right. Let's see what else they say about time. Using time.time. .time. So we've already seen this. We import time. We call time.time. .time. What do we get back? We get back a big long number, right? And here he's telling you what time he did it. February 27, 2015. Had you have called time.time .time at that date and time, you would have gotten this. Uh, let's look at some of the other examples he has. Import time, right? So again, he's pulling in the time module. He says he's defining a function called calcprod. Now, let's look at here, this parentheses. Remember what we saw in the parentheses. Anyone? What do we put in the parentheses in the function declaration? Parameters. Arguments, parameters, there we go. So we're not taking anything. We are creating a function, and essentially all we're doing is jumping here and doing this stuff. We take no arguments. We take no parameters. Declare no parameters, take no arguments. No Calculate, prisoners. what's up? No prisoners. <laughs> no pilsners. Prisoners, ah, yes. No prisoners, yes to prisoners. Uh, product equals one. For i in range one to a large number, product equals product times i, return product. What is that doing? Well, it's just gonna simply multiply together a series of numbers, right? So how do we, what are we doing here? We're benchmarking it, right, clearly. We have start time, we call time.time. .time. This is gonna give us the amount of seconds It's an arbitrary point in the past. We call that the epoch. <coughs> then we're gonna do this, which is just amounts to work, right? Calc prod is just something for the computer to do. It's gonna do it as fast as it can. And then when it do it's done doing that, we're gonna get the time again. And then we're gonna say the result is blank digits long. We're gonna tell you how many digits all of that multiplication is, the, the product of it all. And then we're gonna say it took blank seconds to calculate. We take the end time, subtract the start time, and that's what we get. This is a very rudimentary way of doing a benchmark. This is one way you can do it. And this is the way all of the other ways work. You know, some of them just do it a little bit better and easier for you. But here's the easier way to do it. There's a module out there called Profile, and you click on the link and it takes you to it. And you can see here how the other method works, you know. See Profile Run. But I don't think we're covering that in this chapter. He's just telling you that if you're interested in, in finding out how to make code faster, there's a module specifically created for it called Profile. And we can see how that works if we care, but it's a great way to benchmark your code. So we know how to get the time. What else can we do with it? We can sleep. What does sleeping do? It tells your computer, take a break, chill out. Right, so when do we want to do that? You may want to do that if you have something that you want your computer to do and then you essentially want it to take a break and check back later and resume the task, right? So I'll give you a case in point if you're looking for a file. This is an easy way to do it. It's almost never the rightmost way to do anything, but it's very common to find this. You say, okay, do I have any files uploaded to this FTP server? You wrote a script. No, go to sleep. Wait 30 seconds, wake back up and check again, right? All of that you can do very simply telling your computer to sleep. Now, what happens if we do something like this? We say, okay, well, this is gonna take time. We've already shown that here. What happens if I just keep multiplying? Well, if you keep multiplying instead of using sleep, then what your computer is actually doing is work. And work means you're draining your battery, you're running your computer hot, you're doing all of that kind of crazy stuff that you'd rather not do. So the best way to waste the computer's time is to use sleep. And then it goes to sleep and wakes back up. So how do we do it? Here's an example. Import time for i in range three. It's gonna make i zero, one, two, stop. Print tick, sleep one, print talk, sleep one. It's gonna print tick, it's gonna sleep one and print talk, it's gonna sleep one and print tick, sleep one and print talk, so on and so forth. And then it's gonna call time.sleep5 at the end. Wait five seconds before it's done, right? So that's pretty much all there is to that one. Okay, rounding numbers, right? 
when we did time that time, you remember how we got this big long number like that and it had the decimals after it? Those represent microseconds. Microseconds are incredibly useful to computers and they're almost not useful at all to applications. So when you tell a computer I want the time, it will always, almost always give you back microseconds. And you'll use that oftentimes when you're running like a concurrent application, right? So if you have five people in a database and they're all running transactions, you want to know the exact time someone put $50 in the bank account because you want to make sure it became before the time that someone took $50 out of the bank account, right? And you want that interval to be as small as possible. One second, what if they both hit it? Half a second, there's a substantially less likelihood and so on and so forth. You keep dividing that out and microseconds become incredibly useful for sequences. This ran before this. So when we create these microseconds, now we can figure out how to get rid of them. One method of getting rid of them is calling round, right? So you give round now and two, and you see that all of it's gone except for the first two. Four, there's four significant digits. And if we just say round, well now it gets rid of them all. Numbers under 0.5 get rounded down. Numbers above 0.5 get rounded up. And here's something cool too. We can talk about this. We saw this, I think, in the first chapter. If I go down here back into my Python and I say, uh, let's say a equals uh, 3.14156 times, whatever. Now I have a. If I say int a, what do I get? Three, three. Three. Now here's the catch. If I say round a, what do I get? Three. Three. Right? Now let's change it. Rather than pi, let's go up to 3.8. Now if I say round A, what do I get? Four. Right. So round does not truncate the number. Int always truncates. If I do int A, I get 3. So if you're talking about numbers below 5.5 and below, int and round return the same thing. If you're talking about numbers above, then the difference is there. Truncate and round produce different numbers. Very easy concept, but we've used integer in the past to do this, and now that we're doing it with round, it's important to see that there's a difference. Okay. So moving on, we have the, a super stopwatch. What does a super stopwatch do? A super stopwatch is uh, tracking how much time you spend on boring tasks you haven't automated yet. It's a physical stopwatch. I believe what they're doing is you hit a button, and every time you hit a button, it records how long since the last button hit, and then it takes an average. Uh, so what we're going to do is, at a high level, track the amount of information of time elapsed between button presses of the enter key with each button press starting a new lap. Print the lap total, total time, and lap time. This means your code will need to do the following. Find the current time by calling time.time and store it in a timestamp at the start of your program, as well as at the start of each lap. Keep a lap counter and increment it every time the user presses enter. Calculate the lap time by subtracting the timestamps and handle the, the keyboard interrupt exception so the user can press control C to quit. Now normally when you implement this task, you show the average. I guess we're not doing that too. So if we come down here, let's see if we already have this. I already have that one up. We do, okay. So here's the code that we're using in the book. What we're doing is we say import time. Then we print out essentially the tutorial. We say input. What does input do? Anyone remember? Yeah, it waits for an input. Waits for an input. That's it. Waits for you to press enter specifically. All right, so it's looking for enter. Uh, and then what you're going to do is print started. And here's something else too. For extra bonus questions, does anyone remember what the argument to input does? If I give an argument. It, it gives it the prompt. If I put a different variable there, it'll give me the prompt, like here. If I say this, you're going to see how ours behaves differently, right? OK. Then we print started. We take the time. We say start time equals time dot time. And we say last time equals start dot time. So we're setting both the start time and the last time to being the value of right now. We set the lap equals the one. And we try. We covered exceptions earlier. Exceptions are things that essentially you're saying, if this doesn't work as I intend, I wish to continue, right? 
If you don't catch the exception, then you don't want to continue. And that's the default. It bubbles up. All right. I think that Ed actually taught the lesson on exceptions this time. Was anyone here in the JavaScript class when I taught the exceptions? I guarantee if you did, you remember my analogy. Does anyone here remember my analogy? What was the analogy? What kind of bubbles? Fart bubbles? Fart bubbles in a what? Fart bubbles in a hot tub. See, people don't forget my shit. They remember it. I said this. I said an exception. An exception is like passing a fart bubble, and I'll say it again because it's, it's worth repeating. And then everyone here will remember in six months what exceptions and assertions are. And, uh, and yeah, you'll, you'll remember it the rest of your life. Assertions and exceptions. When you have a problem in a computer program, it creates something, right? It creates an exception. That means that this is not something you intended to happen, but it happened, and now someone's got to deal with it. What's another thing that someone's got to deal with? A fart bubble in a hot tub. Now here's the catch, right? Like a fart bubble in the hot tub, wherever you lay it, it's going to come up, right? And at different layers of that fart bubble propagating to the surface, you can catch that fart bubble and save all of your friends the problems that would otherwise happen and incur. That's like an exception. An exception starts at the lowest level. It could be happening in a library, right, that you've used. When that exception starts, that library has the option to catch that exception so you don't get it, like a dirty fart bubble in a hot tub. But if it doesn't catch it, your program has the opportunity to catch that dirty fart bubble. And if your program doesn't catch it, it's going to bubble up to your user. Your program is going to die, and it's going to say something bad happened. Right? That's like the equivalent of who smelt it, dealt it, but for a computer. You ran the program, the compute program crapped out, and now it's not working. So here's what we do. We create this program that's going to run forever. Now, what's going to happen? How is it going to stop running? It's going to stop running like this. You're going to hold Control and hit C. Anyone ever used Control C before? Or Control Z on Windows? Right? This tells your computer to stop executing. It says, stop running this program. Come on in, Peter. So it says, when you hold Control and you hit C, what you're actually doing is, I'll show you. If you have Linux, and I suggest everyone run it, you have the ability to look this up. You can say man signal, right? These are different little things your computer has inside, right? And they're, they're everywhere. They're in Windows too. It's just you got to go further to read them in Windows. But your computer has different signals, right? And you can send different signals to a program to say that there's a problem. Right? One of them you can do is say, I want to kill this program. Right? You can send a kill signal to a program, or you can send an interrupt signal to a program, and that's what your control Z is doing, or your control C. Is you're, you're sending a signal to that program that says, I want to interrupt this. Right? So when you have that, we can see here we're collecting this keyboard interrupt. Right? We're saying, OK, if that starts, I want to collect it. So when you run this program, it's going to keep running forever and ever and ever until you interrupt it. When you interrupt it, something external to the program told the program to stop. That's going to keep bubbling up until you actually catch it. So we're saying here, try all of this stuff. And then if something bad happens, catch the fart bubble. Right here. Print out done and leave. Right? OK. So here's what we're doing. What are we doing? Because we're running this forever. We say input. We've already established what input does. Input does nothing except wait for you to hit enter. Right? It waits for you to give it input. The input must enter with enter. The input must terminate with enter. There we go. And then after it sees that, that enter button, what it does is it continues. And the next line on there is this. Lap time equals round time.time, dot time, which we did before we started minus last time, which is the same thing, 0, 2. So, so far, when you hit enter the first time, the lap time is 0. Total time, time dot time, current time. No, it's not 0. I'm sorry. It's, it's the difference between when you started the program and when you hit enter. That's the lap time, right? 
so far. The first iteration, the lap time, is the difference between when you started the program and when you hit enter. And the total time is going to be the same thing. Why? Because the total time is also the time dot time from when you start the program, from when you, when you get here, rather, to when you started the program, right? So then we print out the lap number, the total time, and the lap time. And we increment the lap number. And then we say the last time is now, and we restart. And then that's going to change here, the lap time. The total time doesn't change. We use the same formula, and we continue. Let's give it a shot, because we have four different times in there. We have the start time, the end time, and the lap start time, and the end time. So let's just see how that, that works, right? Now, we can see this here. We had the question earlier, what does the argument to input do? The argument to input creates the prompt. And there's our prompt, press enter. So we hit enter, started. There's my first lap. There's my second lap. Third, fourth lap, fifth lap, sixth lap, seventh lap. You can see what it's doing. The first lap took two seconds, and that means 2.15 seconds, which means the whole program took 2.15 seconds. The second program took 4.6 seconds. That's not right, is it? It was total time, then lap time. I don't know why. There we go. It's total time, then lap time. Who's calling me? Who is calling me? OK. That's obnoxious. I'm glad they stopped. Uh, yeah, that's my Google Voice in some window somewhere. Let me see here. One second. Yeah, I don't even know where it came from. OK. Uh, we'll mute it. So what we have is uh, this on the left-hand side. We had the correction. The left-hand side is the total time. The right-hand side is the lap time. So we have total time 2.15, lap time 2.15, total time 4.16, lap time 2.45, total time 2.69, lap time. Each time we are adding to the total time the lap time and printing out a new total. So previous total, lap time, new total. Previous total, lap time, new total, right? Uh, yes, yeah, previous time, lap time, new total. Previous time, lap time, new total. I believe that's right. OK. Uh, and let's go back. Oh, we have to go. You guys have an easy time getting in? Did someone call? No? Yeah, it's quite cold. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, I, I was writing a message and, Marco, and someone let you Marco in? Me, yeah. Oh, very cool. Is Marco here? Yeah, uh, yeah he's waiting. With oh, his cool. I didn't know Marco was here. I thought he went home. Cool. Yeah, I dig it. OK. Uh, so moving on. Uh, track and print times, we've already done that. We showed that, too. So this is essentially, this is an incremental thing. What we did in the first one, when they were designing it, is they essentially bulleted pointed this out, or they just collected it. So they didn't actually write the loop. They left it under to-do, start tracking the lap times. And we jumped right into the code, and our code had the to-do already filmed out, and we talked about the exceptions and all that other stuff. And great. Ideas for similar programs. OK. So you're bored, you want to do something similar to that, here's great ideas. Create a simple timesheet app that records when you type a person's name and uses the current clock to clock them in or out, right? Uh, add a feature to your program to display the elapsed time in seconds since the process started, such as a download that uses the request module. So if you actually want to time how long it takes you to download something, you can use request and time, both of them together. You would essentially say time bad time, you'd run your request, then you call time bad time and you'd have your end time. So you have your start time and your end time. The difference between those two is the download time. OK. And lastly, uh, intermittently check how long a program has been running and offer the user a chance to cancel tasks that are taking too long. That's substantially more complex. OK. So we have time pretty much well figured out. Now we have a concept of date time, right? And date time is essentially just time shuttled along with the date, right? So these two concepts are somewhat integral. They're the same. 
it's really, really difficult to separate the concept of a date from the concept of time. So most of the time, you'll find something like date time more often used than either one of them independently, right? And the reason for that is simple. If I say I wish to add five hours to today, it really matters what today is, right? If you're adding that five hours on a leap day, you're gonna get a different result or you could get a different result than if you were adding them on a regular day or something of that sort. Maybe you don't roll over to February 28th, you roll over to the next month or something like that. Okay, so what we do here is we import date time and then we say date time dot date time. Why? Because the module date time, this is like a different type of looking thing. So if we go over this for a second, the module date time has its own date time data type, right? So there's a class inside of this module called date time. And this, this is the class here. So we say in this module date time, there's a class date time. And this class date time has a method date time. And I want to call that. And the object it returns, I want to call now. Right? So let's take a look at that. OK. Uh, Python 3, I'll show you here. We can go import date time. And if I go help date time, you can see here the classes that it exports. Built-in object, date, date time. What they're actually showing you here is that date time is a subclass of date, right? So it provides you additional things that date does not. And then it has time, time delta, time zone info, and time zone, right? So if we want to use this, what we could do is we could say here, import date time. And then I can say datetime.datetime.now, right? Alternatively, Python has another syntax too, and this is hopefully something value added. It's, you can read about this if you care on how import works, right? So you should actually be able to say help import, I believe. Nope, you can't. You gotta read the docs on the website. But you could say from, uh, uh, from date time, import date time. And with that construct, you can actually say date time now. Right? So if you notice here, we're saying date time dot date time dot now. If that gets really boring or you find that repulsive, like I do, because it's really stupid, you can actually say from date time, import date time. And what that's going to do is it's going to open up the date time module and it's only going to pull out the date time class. So what's in date time that's not date time? Time and the other stuff we just went over. So if I go here, import date time, and then I go help date time, you're going to see here date is the one, right? So I could also go from uh, date time, import date, and I should be able to go date now. No, help date. Date new. Right, and then you have day, month, year. Date time dot date, day, month, year. You're gonna get the minimum date time dot date here, and you get something other crazy. So date time dot date, or rather date. Let's try this one one one. Yeah, no, 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 it's a good question. Let's see here, from date time, import date. I don't know why it's not documenting that. Date.max? There you go, okay, whatever. Uh, there's a function in there called max, which tells you the maximum date, if you care and min, which tells you the minimum date. So date, so there's a date feature that has all of this stuff here, but the predominant things that they're documenting are min and max. I guess. So that's not very useful. Everyone uses the date time thing, and I guess that's why I see it so often. Moving on, date time module. So, so far we've covered a little bit on it. 
Uh, we have daytime now, we have daytime, daytime. We give daytime, daytime with the constructor, right? So in this case, their daytime is uh, the data type inside of the module, right? This class, this data type. And daytime is the constructor by the same name. So we say daytime, daytime. And we provide to it the year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds. What do we get back? Year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds, right? So the point here that they're trying to make is that the constructor itself is taking the values already parsed, right? So you give it the parse values, you can create the object with it, and then from that object, you can call year, month, date, whatever you want on that object, and you can see those values, okay? So not just year, month, and day, but also hour, minutes, and seconds, right? Both parts of it. So we look down, we say a Unix epoch timestamp can convert it to a daytime object with a daytime, daytime from timestamp function. So we talked about there being two different types of date objects, right? One of them in which you have all the crap inside of it, and the other one which is essentially just the second counter. Well, how do we go from one that has the second counter to one that has all of the elements of a daytime object? We create one with the second counter, and that's what from timestamp does, right? Now, a lot of other languages don't call it from timestamp. They call it from epoch or something of that sort. Of thing. So when you look at a different language, which is this is a lot of this is about, right? Uh, you may want to keep in mind that you're providing to it the seconds since the epoch. So you may find the name of the method something like from timestamp, right? Uh, seconds since epoch is another one you'll see in some languages. There's different ways to call it, but you understand the idea. You understand that if someone gives you one big long number and it's really high, it's likely seconds since epoch, and that's what you have to find to make your daytime object. You can call daytime, daytime from timestamp and give it time dot time. You should never do this. This is not a good idea. Why is this not a good idea? Well, let's take a look at what it returns, right? Let's take a look at this. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. So now we have daytime and we have all this stuff in it, right? It's showing it. But you could also call daytime.local time. Nope, that's not it. What was it? Uh, daytime.daytime.now, rather. Daytime.daytime.now, right? So we have two different methods and they do the same thing. The top method, we're telling it right here that we want the value right now. And in the bottom method, what we're doing is we're saying we want the amount of seconds since epoch, and then we want to take those seconds and create a daytime object with it. In the top method, we tell it exactly what we want, and the implementation can do it in the fastest way possible. In the bottom method, what we're doing is we're saying we want to convert from seconds. And because we want to convert from seconds, we need to get the amount of time as a second, right? So the, the, real, the real downside to this is, we know that time.time .time is going to return a float, right? This datetime.datetime.now may not have to ever have a float of seconds in C5, right? So we can do what it wants to do internally, without having to shuffle everything into this intermediate format. So in the bottom method, we use an intermediate format, that float that represents the seconds since the epoch. And in the top method, what we're doing is we're saying we just want to get the time right now. And it doesn't have to use an intermediate format. Okay. So if we move down, we can look at it. Halloween 2015, how do we construct that object? 2015, 10.31, 0.0.0. First second of Halloween. 2016, 1.1.1, 1, 1, 1, January 1st, 2016. Very first second. 2015, 10.31, this is going to be New Year's Eve. No, October 31st, rather. New Year's Eve would be 12.30. This is 10.31. Uh, and we can, we can actually use the equality operator here, right, to test it. So, when we take two different date times, we can tell whether or not they're equal 
using the same method that we tell whether or not any other two times are equal or any other two things are equal. So if we say five equals five, it's very simple. We're comparing two integers. But we could also say date time or whatever the object is, right? We're saying Halloween 2015. Halloween 2015 equals October 31st, 2015, right? And one of the things to keep in mind here is that date time dot date time dot now is going to return microseconds. So if I do this, date time dot date time dot now equals date time dot date time dot now, what is this going to return? So what is it going to return? False, false. False, right? So keep in mind that the left side doesn't get value evaluated at the very same time the right side gets evaluated. In. So because you're saying, I want the time now, and then you're saying, I want the time now, those two things get evaluated at a different time. They have different microsecond intervals, and it's false. This is why I wanted to, I wanted to drive the point home that microseconds are not always useful to people, but you have to remember that computers always tilt them around, right? Just part of the game. So learn to think about that all the time. If we say now equals date time <coughs> dot date time dot now, now what happens if I say now equals now? True. True. <coughs> because in this case, I, I evaluated what now was once. Now, now is set, and it will forever be this, no matter how many times I run it. So I can say now equals now, and it works fine. But if I say now equals date time dot date time dot now, what am I going to get? A new now. I'm going to get a new now, which isn't going to be the same as the old now, which is going to return false. No, I'm sorry. You are right, because I, I typoed that. OK, look at that one. That's the one I was describing. I'm going to get a new now, and it's not going to be the same as the, the old now, and I'm going to get false. false. Right. That's exactly right. Good catch, by the way. Very nice. Well done. OK. Uh, <coughs> time delta date, date type. So we now know that time is a very complex subject, and it's nice to have other things that help us out with it. Uh, here's the thing. The difference between two times is also a complex subject, and it's nice to have something that helps us out with that, too. So. If we take two at an end time and a start time, we subtract and we get a delta, we get a difference. We can do different things with that delta, right? And in fact, some databases even have a special type that represents that delta. Wink, wink, Postgres, if you are looking at learning a database. So uh, what, what can we do with that? Well, we can break that delta up again into different things. Days, seconds, microseconds, total seconds, all of these types of things are components on that delta, the difference between two different times, right? Now, because we have a delta here, this represents the difference between two different times. What other cool things can we want, would we maybe want to do with the delta? We can add it or subtract it from original date time stuff, right? So if I come back here, okay, come back here, I say uh, 500, and then we say import date time, and then I say date time dot date time dot now. Now I have a variable. What if I want to add to it 50 seconds? I get an error. Why? Because on the left hand side I have a date time object, and on the right hand side I have an integer. So what I really want to do is I want to create a delta for the amount of seconds, right? So what I can do though is I can say a plus date time dot time delta equals, and then here, minutes equals or seconds equals 50. Now that worked. So what did we do in this context, right? Well, we took a delta that we created, which is 50 seconds long. Now this can be added to a. The top failed because we don't know what a is. We don't know what, what the, the 50 is, right? The computer sees it and says it's a number. But is it days, minutes, seconds, hours, whatever? You don't know. So you don't have an object that tells you a sufficient amount to modify an actual daytime thing. It makes it not useful. So at this point, 
you now know something else about date times, right? You know that you have an object, a date time, and you can manipulate them only with these other things called date time deltas. Right? So if you want to manipulate them, create a delta. Yes? Um, does the date time object not have like a dot second or dot minute that will return the number of seconds in the date time? It does, but it returns so, them as an integer. Yes, so if you did a dot seconds plus 50, and then set that to a dot seconds, would that work as well? That would, but that would modify the original object rather than return a new one. Okay, so if you look at that, that's exactly right. Everything about that is right. Here what we've done is we have an object, right, date time uh, A, right, A is the object. When I added to A the time delta, right, A didn't change, A stayed the same. But what I also could have done is I could have said this, A dot seconds, right, plus equals 100 and whatever. Is it seconds or seconds? Ah, you may not be able to do this. I thought you would have been able to do this. You cannot do this, the object is frozen. So that doesn't, that actually doesn't work. But let me try something else here. Hey, that's a, no, you cannot do that in Python. Nope. No go. Yeah, the object is, is technically what they call frozen. So it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. The object is immutable. Uh, yeah, the only way to do it is with that. So what you would do is just create that time delta, and then you can do it. All right. <coughs> And just so we can show here too, if we do date time dot time delta, right, I can see what all we can provide with that with help. Right, so you can see here that we get days, microseconds, seconds, and then we can also find the max value, the min value, and then the resolution, right, which is how small of an increment you can represent in the delta in this version of Python. And actually, if we help date time dot date time, doesn't actually document it as being a normal. That kind of shocks me on that one. But, um, here we go. Date descriptors defined as. No. Well, darn. Uh, yeah, but anyway, we know when we tried it, when we do this, a seconds plus equals 110, that we actually get an error. So the object is not writable. It's pretty clear. At that point, right? Okay, uh, moving on. Does everyone get both what the question was, why I was wrong, and what's happening? Does that make sense? So we all follow along. When you create a daytime object, you cannot modify that object itself. That object is forever whatever you created it as. What you can do is add or subtract a daytime interval to it, returning a new daytime object. <coughs> Right? So if I say here a equals 10, right, I can add 5 to 10 like this. Now I have 15, but a stayed equal to 10. That's how a date time works. But you can't go a plus equals 5 because that changes the value of a. And the date time object is read only when you create it. Do we all see that? So that's what a's question was over. It was just, well, could you just simply add to the seconds? And I thought the answer was yes, but lo and behold, the object is not right at all. Okay. All right. Parsing until a specific date. So we have this thing, daytime sleep. We've showed that off. I think we have, we have not covered this one now. And what we're doing here is we say, while daytime is less, than, while now is less than Halloween of 2016, sleep one. What is this going to do? This is going to create a program that presumes it's created before Halloween of 2016, and then all it does is sleep until it gets to that point in time. All right? So it's a way of saying, I don't want to do anything until this point in time. How do you do it? That's how you do it. Now, I think that this would be tremendously problematic right now, because, uh, yeah, that we wouldn't do anything, because 2016 was three years ago. Mm -hmm. right? So it's going to start off, and now is going to be greater than 2016. 
So it's simply not going to sleep, and it's going to move on with life. But that's because the book is created before that. Converting daytime objects into strings. Each timestamp and daytime objects aren't friendly to the human eye. Use the strf time method to display a daytime object. The f stands for format. So this is telling you that there's different ways in which you can format strings. You guys remember how we did that earlier on? I don't think that we covered too many of them, but there's a lot of different ways in which we can format a string. Uh, one of them is we can say something like with the percent signs, hello. And what that's doing is it's allowing us to format this string on the left-hand side with this string on the right-hand side. So it's saying, I'm expecting one string object here, and that's going to be word, world, right? And then this percent sign separates the left, which is the format string, from the right, which is the arguments. I could also do this, hello, percent sign s for string, percent sign s, and then I can say world hlug. I need parentheses there? I didn't think I needed parentheses. That's it, I need parentheses. Okay. So this is how we can format strings in Python, right? Very simply using this method. But with this strf time, we can format dates too. So how do we do that? We have now, we don't have now, I thought I created it. Uh, Datetime.datetime.now. Date time. Give us something else. Now, object. now I have an object, daytime to daytime to now. What I can do here is we can use this method down here just like this, object.strf time, to create something new with a specific format. Like let's say that I want to put month first, right? And then I want to say uh, month, but this is the year. This should work too. Oh, that's because I forgot the method. STRF. There we go. So what we can do here is we can state what we want to format, right, to this argument to STRF time. But rather than just simply percent sign S, which is what we did here, right? Rather than just simply this, what we have gained is the ability to substitute in the year, the month, all of that other kind of stuff. So you can see that here. Year with century, percent sign Y. Year with month, percent, I mean month, percent sign M. Uh, full month, percent sign B. You can create strings with that using strf time, and it looks just like this thing does up here, which is actually str time, or str, uh, no, I'm sorry, sprint f, right? That's what they call that. They call that the sprint f format. It's just like that, except rather than just simply percent sign S, which is the only option here that we're covering, you get other things like percent sign M and percent sign year and all of that other kind of stuff. Okay. So you can see here, they, they say October 21st at STRF time, E of Y. What does that say? October of 15th. Right? You can do whatever you want there. Converting strings into daytime objects, right? So here we're taking it and we're saying daytime.daytime STRP time. Right, what is STRP time? STRP time does the opposite of STRF time. STRF time takes a daytime object and tells you how to format it as a string. STRP time is gonna take a string and a pattern and read them together. So here's the string that we provided. Notice this is not a date. And here's the pattern that matches it. And it parses the string with the pattern. So strp time parses the string, strf time formats the string. Okay, and there's 10,000 different ways you can use it. If someone gives you a string and you need to make it a date, use strp time. If someone gives you a date object and you need to make it a string, use strf time. And here's the review of these functions, and they're all right down here. So, yeah. Total seconds method is for the time delta object returns the total number of seconds uh, the time delta object represents. 
So this is essentially when we did this time delta stuff. Here. We did this. We were we could have taken this date time dot time delta seconds equals fifty, and we can actually say on top of that dot total seconds, and it should return fifty. Well, if I call it, there we go. So date time dot time delta seconds equals fifty. That's going to create us a time delta object, and then we can look inside of it, and I can say how many seconds are inside, and we get this fifty. And we already went over the other side. Okay. So now we know how to do all this time stuff. The other thing that we can do with Python, or one thing that you will never want to do in the early stages, but you will always want to do in the later stages, is this concept of concurrency and parallel programming, right? And essentially what you're going to be doing here is you say, okay, I have a resource. How do I make, make, best make use of this resource? Right? So one of those resources inside of a computer is the CPU. The CPU tells you how much computational power you have in that computer. If that CPU is working at 100% efficiency all of the time, you can't do any more work. You're what they said, you're what they call CPU bound, right? If that CPU is not sleeping, it's working as fast as it can, and it's never, it's never not doing, it's, it's never not being productive. It's very, very seldom today that you will ever have a CPU bound application that you write. So most of your applications that you write and will ever write will not be CPU bound. They will be what they call I.O. bound. What is I.O.? Okay, your computer can run faster than your internet connection, right? The best case scenario, your computer can download one gigabit of data, right? That's from the internet. That's faster than I think you can even, I don't know, Robert, did they sell that line for your residence? Yes. How much does it cost? Bit. You have a gigabit? It's only $95. Okay, for $100 a month, you can get a gigabit, gigabit connection in your house. AT&T. Yeah. So Comcast has two gigabit for the record. <coughs> so they're check for us. Maybe ten gig in my house. There you go. <laughs> so, but even with that type of connection, right? It's very difficult to have the machine not be I/O bound, right? What do I mean by that? I mean this: that your connection can't keep up with your computer, even if you have an old computer. Chances are the slowest link is not the computer, it's your connection to the outside world, right? So what does that mean? Uh, essentially what I'm telling you is if you buy a faster laptop, most of your shit won't run quick, will, will not run quicker. It'll, it will run at the same speed. The reason is because the computer is very seldom the slowest link in the chain. The slowest link in the chain is the internet. How do you get around that, right? You can do more than one thing online or you can simply not just spend all of your computer's programs time downloading stuff. You can do other things in the background. So what you can do is you can say, okay, while I'm downloading something off of this connection, do real work with my CPU. Why? Because the CPU is not bound. It's free, it's sleeping, it's waiting on your network. So your CPU goes and it runs off and does other parts of your program. Then your internet connection finally finishes downloading that filing key. Now your CPU can handle that. Right? And potentially, while your CPU is handling that, you could be downloading something else online. And you keep this process going. You want to try to keep both of those pipelines filled, where your computer is always downloading something online and it's always working on something locally. So what we do here is we have this, this concept of how do we make this happen? And one method of making that happen is with multi-threading. So we're gonna see how Python does that, right? Multi-threading gives Python the ability to do more than one thing at a time, right? So if you're CPU bound, there's no advantage. But if you're I.O. bound, you can download, you can do multiple different things at the same time. Okay, this code designates a start time of October 31st, 2029, and keeps calling time.sleep one until the start time arrives. Your, comp your program cannot do anything while waiting for the loop of time.sleep calls to finish it. It just sits around until Halloween 2029. This is because Python programs by default have a single thread of execution, right? That means that when you have a core, I mean, this is getting, I know it's getting a little bit deep, but I kind of want you guys to have like, some understanding of this concept so you understand what this is actually for and why you will not be using it too often. When you buy a computer and that computer has something like four cores, right? 
each different core can do one thing at a time, right? So one of the things you can do with your program is balance it so it uses all four cores. By default, Python has a single thread of execution. What does that mean? That means that by default, your Python program, if it's just doing CPU work, will only ever use one of those cores. And you can use this feature multi-threading to create four different threads and run each one of them on a different core. Right? Okay. To understand what a thread of execution is, remember that in chapter two we discussed the discussion of flow control, where you imagine the execution of your program is placing your finger on a line of code in your program and moving to the next line, wherever it was sent by the control flow statement. A single threaded program has only one finger, uh, but a multi-threaded program has multiple fingers. Each finger moves to the next line of code as defined in the flow control statements, but the fingers can be at different places in the program executing different lines of code at the same time. So you can do multiple things at the same time. Rather than having all of your code wait until time.sleep finishes, you can instead delay that code right, using this concept of scheduled execution with threading. And that's what they're going to introduce. So we say we're going to import threading and time. We print start of the program. Now what we do is we have this function we've defined. Here's the key. This function can do anything you want, right? What you do is when you call thread object, threading.start, you give it a target. And what it does is it says, I need another thread of execution to jump in and execute this function. So what this person is saying is, I have a program and it includes all of this stuff right here, right? He's executing it. This line runs, this line runs, and then we create a function, right? Now what we're doing here is we're saying we want to create a new thread, and what that thread is going to do is execute this function, take a nap, right? Then we're going to start that thread. Now what happens? In one thread, we run this function, and in the master thread, we run end of program. So you can see here what this does. So let's take a look at it. Let's copy it over. Oh, is it in this thing? There we go. Start of program, right? Prints that out. Then it immediately prints out end of program. Then the other thread, which we started here, right? Sleeps for five seconds and it prints wake up. So you see these are in out of order. Start of program, end of program, wake up. Why? Because the main thread finished execution. It finished running this, but the other thread only ran take a nap. And when the other thread jumped in and took a nap, it slept five seconds and it printed wake up. Does everyone kind of see that? I don't know, A, how much we care, and B, if we're following along. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. It's just essentially how we can, we can create things that make better use of hardware and resources. But the end result of it is, is that we're no longer just executing from the top to the bottom of the page. We're jumping around and things happen out of order and out of sequence. So we're compiling a function, then the child thread calls that function with take an app, but the parent thread doesn't care that the child function is waiting because that's a whole different component of the program. A whole different component of the program, a whole different thread of execution is sleeping, and you're done. You print end of program. Then that other component wakes up, that other thread wakes up, and it says print wake up, and it's done. Now you're both done. So that's how that works, and that's why we see it in that weird start of program, end of program. Then the other thread wakes up, prints wake up, and it's done. Okay. Passing arguments to the thread uh, to the threads target function, right? So we have these concepts here of arguments, and now we're going to see how we can pass them to the function. If you look up here, we did not pass anything into take a nap, and here we said to the target take a nap. There are no functions here, so how do we pass functions? How do we pass arguments rather to the function? What we do is we provide it in this args argument, right? So if you'll see here, we have in it. Args, and then we set that equal to something. 
We don't normally do that with Python, right? So normally when you want to do something, like print, you provide all of the arguments inside of parentheses, right? But when you call this threading module, threading.thread, it does not take the arguments for the function in parentheses. Why? Because the argument that it wants is the function. The target here is print, right? That is the target. That's what we want our thread to do. And because we're passing the name of the function in the arguments to threading.thread, we have to have a different method to pass the arguments to print. And how do we do that? We pass the arguments to print in a note in right here, in essentially uh, an object, right? Cats, dogs, frogs, comma, and then we say KWR, separation equals n. Okay. So uh, one second here. We need to pass KWR separation equals this. Okay. Yes, there's two different arguments then. That's what they're doing. Okay. So the reason why they're only passing this KWR thing is because they're, they're passing to print this. Separation equals this. So here's the argument list, and then here's KWR, which is everything after it. So this is actually a very complex example. I'll tell you why. It's a complex example because this part here isn't needed to show this concept at all. We have this thing. Well, let's open it back up, and let's edit this thread memo, right? And I'm going to try to make this a little easier. There we go. Uh, let's copy and paste this. I remove this, the separation component. That's closer to what I think we should be looking at here. Python 3 thread demo, right? Cats, dogs, frogs, like that. What I'm doing here in this is I'm saying threading.thread, create a new thread of execution, and I want you to target the print function right here. Right? Now, because I'm passing the name of the function that I want to start in the thread right, as an argument to threading.thread, because the name of the function is the argument to threading.thread, I have to have a method that I can use to pass the arguments of print. How do I do that? I do that by providing to threading.thread right, a list of print's arguments as args equals something. And that's all that we're doing here. Now in the book, they have this other thing that they're showing, which is this, right? And it says KWRs. And this is what the books looks like. So in the book, they pass args equals this, and they pass KWRs equals this. I think that that makes that more complex than it needs to be to illustrate this problem. But what they're showing to you is KWRs is essentially this part of the print statement where they have separation equals the ampersand. So that's what's going on there. KWRs is simply the name for additional arguments in Python. And they chose to show you an example that has not just arguments but additional arguments. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we have a method. Yeah. Sorry, real quick. Uh, is there a difference between uh, threading and parallels? What is it? Parallelization? Mm -hmm. Parallels or parallelization? Is yeah. there a spend to spend it? The threading is one method in which you can accomplish the task. Okay. So threading is the method, and the goal is better utilization of resources, or which is parallelization. Right. Okay. Uh, but it gets even more confusing when you get down to what is a real thread and what is not a real thread, um, which is a whole other topic. So when we say thread, I'm referring to what Python calls threading.thread. Different circles use different names for this. Okay. So uh, 
That's it. Now, concurrency programming, again, there, there's nothing really more to that. You pass the target is the name of the function, right? They're telling you here, this is an incorrect way, so don't even use this. In normal circumstances, you would want to pass the arguments to print like this. This is actually kind of useful, actually. It's useful for two things. If you're paying attention, don't ever type code like this. If you're not paying attention, the reason why I'm having a difficult time explaining this is because I'm using words to describe what you're looking at here. You want to intuitively tell this thing, threading.thread, to call this function and pass it these arguments, right? It has a different, really weird syntax for it. This is probably what you would expect if you're new to programming. You would expect to tell threading.thread what to call by using the name of the function and then providing the arguments to that function, right? Like this. But you don't. So just get used to it. How do you pass to it the name of the arguments to your function? You do it in this way up here, with args equals and kw args equals. And that effectively does this. Right? So it's just a different syntax. Okay. I hope that that makes sense looking at it more than me using args a thousand times. Uh, so now what we do is, is we're looking at the program downloader and we're trying to use a function to, to fix that. Now, I just told you that most of the time your program is not CPU bound. Previously in the, in the last class that I thought was like a really killer not dead class, we did that crawling thing with the XKCD comics. You guys remember that? We downloaded all the shit ton of comics online. We're like, okay, that's really cool. Now, I just told you your computer is not CPU bound, right? What does that mean you're waiting on? Why isn't that done instantaneously? It's not done instantaneously because each time, what it has to do is it has to say, hello XKCD, I want to get this comic. Then XKCD has to go to its hard drive and say, I found this comic, let me give that comic to you. And it does all of this stuff with HTTP requests. Then it gives that comic to you over a slow internet connection, relatively. You have to take that comic from the slow internet connection and write it to the hard drive. All of these things, the internet connection, XKCD working, their hard drive, your hard drive, all of these things have nothing to do with your CPU. So how do we make it to where we can do all of those things and not tax out your CPU? Well, what we do is we simply use threading. And we say, okay, I can open up now 10, 20 different threads, and each one of those threads We'll start a conversation with XKCD, say I need this comic, we'll wait for it, we'll write that comic down, and then that thread will be done. And I can start another thread, right? Because now, you don't have to wait for a thread. You simply say, spin off 20 threads, they all go off and do their thing, you wait, right? When they're all done doing their thing, you can say, spin off another 20 threads. And you're always doing 20 things at a time. You can work that in different ways now. Right? You're not just simply waiting for, okay, did I, did I send a message to XKC, did it respond yet? If not, wait. When I get it, okay, make sure it's the right one. Write it to the hard disk. Is it written yet? When it's written, move on to the next one. You, you can do more things at a time. Here's how you do it, right? We call os.makers and we create a directory and we say if the directory exists, right, then simply don't, we don't care, right? Is this okay? True. We define this thing called download.xkcd. Now this is a, uh, a function, and it takes a star comic and an end comic, comic, right? So what is it gonna do? For the range in star comic, end comic, we all remember what range does, right? It returns a list, it returns an iterator of uh, one till the end, zero until the end, rather. So if I say range, list range 10, I'm gonna get zero to nine. So essentially we give it two numbers, and then we start looping over that range. We say print downloading page xkcd number, and then we give it the number. And then we say request.get, mm -hmm. and this is the slow part, this is the part where you're waiting for the internet, and we wait. We essentially wait to get this result. Now, this is one of the things that the thread will do. The thread will stop it from where you are waiting for that result. If we run download xkcd in a thread, then the thread is waiting for that result. You are not waiting for that result, right? Substantially faster. Now, the thread is gonna be doing something like parsing that with beautiful soup. 
you know, getting the comic image out, downloading the image, moving on to the next one, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at here the end result, and we'll just jump right to it. Here's what we're doing here. We create this function called download XKCD, start comic and comic. We essentially print the location and we start to get to work. Now what we've done here is in this one, we create a new thread for all of these different ranges, right? So what we're doing is we loop 14 times, we create 14 threads, right? So for each one of these, what we're doing is creating a different thread, right? We have this list an empty list of download threads. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a download thread, set it equal to our new thread, which targets download XKCD, right? What is it gonna pass to it? It's gonna pass to it one, or I rather, I, which is gonna change for zero to 1400, right, by 100. Just to be clear, I am not 100% sure we went over this syntax here, what this number does is it says by, right? Have we seen this before, this third, this third argument of range? Okay, cool, let's recap one time here really quick. If we do, uh, if we do this, uh, Python three, and I do range uh, zero, 10, two, I am actually going to list now, not all things between zero and nine, but all things between 0 and 9 by 2. 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. If I do 0, 1400, 100, I'm going to list 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, so far. Right? Okay. So that's what we're doing in this case. I just want you to be sure that if you get confused, it's because we're looping for each 100 items. Right? So we're saying here, we want 0 to 1400 by each 100. We're starting a new thread, and it's going to download everything from 0 until 99, right? Then the next time, it's going to download everything from 100 to 199. Then it's going to download everything from 200 until 299, so on and so forth. Because we're only going to get values of 100 from this. I will only ever be a value of 100. Do we see that? Okay. Now what is it going to call? It's going to call the download XKCD. So download XKCD is right up here, right? And we're going to call this each time with a batch of 100. So whereas before we called it until we exhausted the whole list, we just did one after another, after another, after another. Here what we're going to do is we're going to simply make 14 different batches, each one with 100 images, 100 different parts of that content. And we're going to run them all at the same time. So all of those 14 batches will be iterating over this. We will download 14 uh, websites at the same time. Those 14 websites, when they're done being downloaded, the batch will move on and it will download the 14 images underneath them at the website. Then it will move on to the next image in the batch. So we have 14 batches that are going to be running through this, churning. Give me the website, parse the website, find the image, download the image. Then the next one in the batch. Give me the website, parse the website, get me the image, save the image. You know, All in that sequence. So when we look at it, just to be sure, I'm going to show you one more time here. Recap everyone. When we look at this XKCD, if I give it a number of 1, 2, 3, 4, <laughs> I'm not online. <laughs> I am online. When I give it a, uh, a website like this, the way this downloader is supposed to work is we're going to have batches. Those batches have a hundred of these things in them each time. We don't just need these, this thing. We need to parse this page out, right? We need to parse this page out, and we're trying to find this image. Then we want to save this image. That's what our goal is. Okay. 
So this is where we're doing it. This is what creates the batch. Start of the batch, the end of the batch. We use beautiful soup, that model we used earlier, to parse that web page. When we parse that web page, we're selecting comic image, and we're getting the value of the source, which is that link. Then what we're doing is we're saving it, right? Right down here. We open up a new file, XKCD, with the location of it. We write out all of those different bytes. We went through this in that class to save the file, and then we move on. So one batch is gonna do this, right, for each thing inside of that batch you create. The batch is gonna have 100 things in it, we're gonna do it for each one of those 100 things. That's what the format is. And then when it's done, what do we do? We call this download threads.join. Now this is a cool thing, we didn't see this so far. They talk about it in the book. What we do here is, each different time we create a new thread, right, we create a new thread on this line. We add to the download threads array right here that thread. Now we know we're creating 14 threads, right? We even have the comment right here that says creates 14 threads. Why are we creating 14 threads? Because we're creating one thread for each thing that we get from 0 to 1400 by each 100 elements. So 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, all the way to 1300. Each different thread we create, we add to this list, and then here's the trick. At the end, we say download thread.join. Why? Anyone have any guesses? What would happen if we didn't say download thread.join then? The program would run off the main program would run off the end. Exactly. Really good. You got any service programming? A bit. And I've actually done multi-thread. There you go. That's exactly right. We have different threads of execution for each different batch. Each different batch has work. But the thing that makes the batches is done, right? So we have one thing, its job is to make batches. We have another thing, and its job is to process one of those batches. We're gonna create 14 of those things that process batches. But this guy over here, whose job it was to make the batches, after he's created those batches, he's done. He's ready to finish. All of those other guys got a ton of work to do. Right, shit needs to get done. He shoveled it off on them. Now he's out of the picture. So you don't want him to quit. Why? Because if he quits, you're never gonna know when everyone else is done. So what do you do? You say wait, essentially. You want him to wait. And you do that by calling download thread.join. This does exactly what was just described. Download thread.join says make sure all of those threads have finished executing before I can return. All of those threads are those batches. Each one of them is processing a batch. So when all of those batches, which are all working at the same time, finish downloading, processing the 100 web pages, and finish downloading the 100 images that they have, each one of those batches is going to be complete. When they're all complete, this will return true. And when it returns true, you get done. And that's it. So that's it. Now let me go back and I want to show you something. This download thread.join, one more time. We had a problem earlier, right? Now that we have introduced this concept. And this is a lot to swallow and it's really awkward to talk about time and multi-threading, which are two important things, just like this, but that's how we do it. Uh, if we go back here and we say, uh, where was that original example? What was the first threading example we did? I actually made a note to keep that around. It was right here, I think. Remember the one that we did and it said hello at the end? Oh, oh. Here. This is the one, right? This is the one I want. I'm going to copy this, right? And what I'm going to do is. If I run this program right here, Python 3, test.py, 
We say start of program, end of program, and then at the end, we print wake up, right? If I wanted to make that sequence, what would I do? I would want to wait for this thread to finish, right, before I print end of program. That's what I want. I don't want to print wake up. I don't want to print end of program before I print wake up. How do I say wait for this thread to finish before you print end of program? Well, let's go back here. And then let's go down to the bottom. And we can see here what we're doing. We say thread download.join. Right? Download threads.join. What we can do is, when we see this, we have this empty list here of the threads. We can just simply come up here and say threads equals an empty list. Right? Thread object.start. And I can simply say here, threads.append, right? Thread object, like that. And then I can simply say, right before I exit, threads dot, what do I say? Join. You call join on the uh, list, not on the thread. Yeah, you have to add a new way to it. So you could just do like thread object not doing it. Just one. You could actually do that. That would probably be easier. Uh, let's do that. In this case, because we only have one, we can do that. Uh, thread object. Start a program, now it's waiting, it's, it's going to print wake up and then end a program. So there you go, that's exactly a good way to do it. So now we have start a program, now we're waiting to print wake up before we print end a program. And why? Because we added that line inside of it that said threads.join, right here. If I delete this line, thread object.join, it's going to print them again out of sequence. Start a program, end a program, wake up. You see how that dot join tells the parent thread, the thing that called it, it says, wait for me to finish. You know, I'm waiting for you to finish. And then it finishes, and then it prints out. It's just important to have that concept in your head of I'm the thing that created the thread, and after I create the thread, I could be done with everything and quit. You don't usually want that to happen. You want him to wait around. So in order to do that, you say, for every thread you've created, join them, which essentially tells the computer to wait for them all to finish and then the max two approach finishes. Okay. Uh, I think that's that's pretty much it for this. There's projects in here. I don't think there's any point in touching them. They're pretty complex. Uh, we can go over them if you want in the after hours, but it's they're pretty silly. If anyone has any questions about the threading stuff, definitely shoot them out over in chat. Uh, if anyone is really interested in multi-threading and all of that kind of thing, bring an application and we can work on it too. We had someone that was doing downloading uh, Alibaba. That would be a cool thing to like show some examples on. But you know, it's not something you're going to be using all the time. Uh, and in fact, I'd say that most people that are running a language like Python or Perl, they don't tend to use them at all ever. So it's not very commonly used. But you should at least have an idea of what they do and what problems they solve. And that's it.